So hi everyone, I am Swati Garse. I'm from the Azure AI product team. And I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about the capabilities of using Llama 2 on Azure AI. In recent times, I'm sure all of you are aware that large language models, or LLMs, have taken the world by storm. That's because these LLMs are pre-trained on massive amounts of data, and they can be easily adapted for a wide variety of tasks. And because of this capability, these LLMs have made it possible for machines to do things to perform tasks that were previously thought of as being the exclusive domain of human intelligence. And applications include things like translation apps or um, creative content generation. You know, you heard about, about these models writing poetry, uh, virtual chat assistants, just to name a few, right? And that's why it's, it's very important for our users to be able to use these large language models like Llama in, in Azure. So what, what is Llama and what is Llama 2? Llama 2 is the next generation large language model from Meta. It has been developed and released by Meta. And it's pre-trained on, on two trillion tokens of public data. Uh, Llama 2 is available in three different sizes. There's the 7 billion parameter model, the 13 billion parameter model, and the 70 billion parameter model. And all of these are available in both pre-trained and fine-tuned flavors. The pre-trained models are, can be used for text generation tasks, you know, things like creating summaries, writing content, and the fine-tuned models have been fine-tuned using over a million human annotations and they can be used for chat tasks, chat completion tasks. At Microsoft, we are constantly looking for ways to make new and transformative technologies available for our users so that users can leverage these technologies and build on top of them. Earlier this year, back in July, Microsoft and Meta expanded their AI partnership and announced support for the uh, Llama 2 family of models on both Azure and Windows. On this talk, we'll be focusing, about, uh, focusing on the Llama capabilities within Azure, within Azure AI. So what I'm showing here is a screenshot of what we call the Azure model catalog. You can think of the model catalog as your hub for all foundation models. That's where you get started with discovering foundation models, with customizing them, with operationalizing them all in one place. And we'll take a look in, in a demo about you know, how, to take, how to actually use these models. Let's spend a minute talking about capabilities in Azure that make using Llama really, really easy for end users. First of all, there's Azure ML native support, meaning you can use Llama without having to manage the underlying infrastructure or environment dependencies. And when you talk to data scientists who have spent time building you know, traditional models, oftentimes they complain about the amount of time spent on managing this infra or environment dependencies versus actual data science work, right? And, and you'll see like when you use Llama in Azure, all of that is abstracted out for, for the data scientist user, so you can focus on what's important to you and not have to deal with all, all of those dependencies. There's inbuilt, out-of-the-box support for fine-tuning and evaluation of the model. So what is it that you can do with this? With model evaluation, you can pass in your own test data and evaluate if the pre-trained model is good enough for use in your own scenario. Like you'll get metrics against your own test data and, and make, you'll be able to make that decision, is this model good enough for me, right? With fine tuning, you can actually customize the model weights so that uh, you, you train it on your own training data and you customize the model so that it's actually usable and gives you better performance than the pre-trained model in your scenario. And both of these, we'll, we'll go over these in a demo, they're super easy to use. One thing I want to point out about fine-tuning in Azure is the entire fine-tuning job, as we call it, runs in the context of the user's workspace. So your training data never leaves that workspace. And we know for organizations it's extremely important to know that only, only people within that organization have access to their training data, right? It's proprietary training data. You want to customize the model, but you don't want other people to get access to it. 
and that is taken care of for you in Azure. There's support for optimizer libraries like DeepSpeed, ORT, and LoRa. DeepSpeed and ORT speed up the fine tuning process. DeepSpeed uh, speeds this up on, you know, speeds up distributed training by, uh, you know, running this in parallel on multiple GPUs. And ORT, or Onyx Runtime, uh, optimizes fine tuning as it happens within a GPU. So as an end result, your fine tuning completes faster and with fewer resources. And LoRa is a low ranked adaptation of LLMs. And with that, you can complete your fine tuning with a smaller memory and compute footprint. So all of these optimizations are like very easy for you to toggle. I'll, I'll show you guys as we fine tune the model. There's a toggle that you can simply turn on or turn off to get these optimizations in. And finally, when you're deploying any large language model, it's extremely important to mitigate any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of harmful content that this model might generate. We're talking about generative AI models, right? They generate a lot of content. You can imagine people could use them for all kinds of things. The model could potentially generate all kinds of information. And you, as the person building an app with this model, want to make sure that you are protecting your users from any kind of harm that the model could generate. So when you deploy Llama, Llama 2 models in Azure, well, the Azure AI content safety is uh, built in by default into your model de deployments. And again, we'll take a look at how that works. But basically, this Azure AI content safety system is it's a safety system that runs all your model inputs and outputs through an ensemble of models that can detect harmful content in four different categories. It can detect harmful content, which can be labeled as hate, sexual content, violent content, or self-harm related content. And you can configure the safety setting so that at four different levels, so you, know, you can set it to be fully safe or like low, medium, high settings. All of that is configurable. But the main point is because this integration is built in when you deploy Llama to your, uh, when you deploy Llama within Azure, um, all of your inputs and outputs are getting checked for harmful content. And so you are automatically getting a multi-layered approach to safety, right? Azure AI content safety is like your second layer of safety that's protecting you from any harmful content. And the first layer is, of course, any safety built into the model itself. And again, we'll take a look at all of this in the demo. So with that, let's transition to a demo of how a user can come in. All of this, uh, this capability is publicly available. And at the end of this deck, I have a link to a blog where you can learn more about it and you know, get access to the model and try it out. But let me show you how you can actually use this in Azure Model Catalog. So here what we're seeing is the Azure Machine Learning Studio or the Azure AI Studio. And within this, uh, here's where you go in into your model catalog, right? The model catalog is your hub for everything foundation models in Azure. You have models from OpenAI in here. You have other open source models, including models for computer vision in here. Uh, you have models from Hugging Face in this model catalog. And of course, you have the Llama 2 models from Meta in this, in this catalog. So let's take a look at what the Llama 2 models look like. And you have all these filters here. You can filter by collection of models. You know, do you want to see Llama models, OpenAI models, and so on. Uh, and also, you can filter by the inferencing task or the fine tuning task, because these models are available for different um, tasks. But for today, let's focus on the Llama 2 family of models. So when you come in here, you can see all the different Llama models that are available. The, we spoke about the 7 billion, 13 billion, and 70 billion parameter models. And you can see that you have the fine-tuned versions, the ones, the ones which are um, suffixed with chat. They are the ones that are fine-tuned for chat tasks. And the others are your text generation models. And there's also code Llama in there. So let's go ahead and take a look at a simple Llama, Llama 7b model. What you see in here is what we call the model card that contains all the details about this model. 
It tells you about you know, how this model is to be used, what kind of data it was trained on. Um, it includes evaluation results on standard data sets. And you can also scroll down further and see links to sample notebooks that you can use for fine tuning, deploying, evaluating these models. So if you prefer a code-based approach, all of these links to notebooks are right here within the model card for you. And down here, you also see details about like sample inputs and outputs when you actually infer against that model. So going back up to the top of the model card, you see these other buttons. And firstly, on top, you have metadata that tells you more about the model, what task it can be used for, what tasks you can fine tune it for, languages, license, and so on. Uh, but the buttons here are what I wanted to focus on, the evaluate, fine tune, and deploy. So down in the model card, when we looked at evaluation numbers, these were evaluation results of this particular LAMA 2 7 billion parameter model against standard data sets. As a user, you might be curious to see whether this would work in your own scenario, right? Like, it's great that you have these numbers on public data, but how does it do in my, in my workflow, on my data? And in order to do that, it's as simple as going and clicking on this Evaluate button. And you can select your test data set, pass that in. I'll, uh, I won't go through the details of evaluation. I'll show you how you do all of this in fine tuning. But you can pass that in, give it your compute, and run your evaluation job to get computed metrics of how this pre-trained model performs on your, on your test data. Right? That can help you decide whether it's good enough to use in your use case. Assuming this model was good enough to go out, you might want to go ahead and deploy that model. So you click in here, and then you have two kinds of deployments you can create, a real-time online endpoint, endpoint or a batch endpoint where you can infer in batches. And as you go ahead and create this real-time endpoint, you see that the first thing it tells you is, by the way, I'm going to enable Azure AI content safety by default. Right? This is the same two-layer safety approach I was talking about, where uh, you can configure Azure AI content safety to uh, to detect harmful content in both the inputs and outputs in those four different categories, and you can set it at different levels. So as a user, when you're deploying this, this is extremely important because you are automatically getting a multi-layer approach to mitigating any harms that, the, that this model can generate. And when you go proceed using Azure AI content safety, it opens up a standard notebook. And if you look at the steps in here, these are standard Azure machine learning steps for deploying a model. But down here, you would see more details, like right in here in this section. You would see details on how you can create the, uh, create the endpoint and create Azure AI content safety integrated into that endpoint. Right? All of that is it's fairly straightforward to deploy from within this notebook. Now let's assume for a moment that your evaluation data showed you that the model was not good enough to use right away, right? Because oftentimes your use case might be very specific to the data you want to work on. Let's take an example of someone who might be, um, who might be working on, on um, you know, building a model that can look at um, short videos with dialogues and then caption those uh, videos with a summary of the dialogues. If you were to do something as specific as this, you can imagine you might want to go and fine tune that model with your own training data, right? The, the pre-trained model might not work right out of the box for you. So you go ahead here and you decide to fine tune the model. And let's take a look at advanced settings because it, it shows you all the different controls you have. Many of these advanced settings are optional, but I did want to show you the optimizations we spoke about. So in here, uh, I can give my fine tuning job a name and I can put it in, a, in an experiment for organizing all my fine tuning runs. Uh, and then this is where I choose as a user and say, hey, I wanted to build this model for summarizing dialogues, which is a text generation task. And so I select that. And the only thing I really need to bring in for my fine tuning is my own training data, right? And so I come in here and I can either upload a new data set or point to an existing data set in my workspace. Uh, since I'm trying to fine tune my model for summarization, I am going to 
use a data set which has summaries of dialogues. It's, it's a, in this case, it's a public data set I'm using. It's the Samsung data set, and you can see what that looks like. In the first column, you have a long dialogue you know, between two people and the back and forth going on. And the second column contains a brief summary explaining exactly what happened in that dialogue. Right? That's exactly the kind of training data I want to fine tune my model and customize it. So I come in here and I map those columns and say, yep, get the first column from the column called text and get my ground truth from my input data column called ground truth. And I go ahead and um, that, that's basically the bare minimum I need in order to fine tune my model. But I can, if I want, pass in separate data sets for validation and testing. And if not, it'll simply take an automatic split out of my training data that I provided and use that for validation and testing. Right? And then this is where I can come in as a user, and if I wanted extra control, I can come in here and configure all these different parameters of fine tuning. Like there are things like the number of epochs or you know, my batch size, but I also have things like uh, enabling LoRa or enabling any of the other optimizations we spoke about so that my fine tuning completes faster and with a smaller memory footprint. And once again, you know, all of, these, all of these parameters are optional. If you're new to fine tuning, you do, not need to, like, you do not need to change any of these values. They will all come with default values. But if you, as you iterate over your fine tuning experiments, if you want to try different values, this is where you come in and update those settings. Right? And then, of course, you need compute to run your fine tuning. And you would need GPU compute for, a model, for fine tuning a model like LoRa. And so I provide the compute that I have in my Azure Machine Learning workspace, and I go ahead and I submit a fine tuning run. Now you can imagine that the actual process of fine tuning would take a little while, right? For the data set that I have, it would probably take me a couple of hours. So in the interest of time, I shall cancel out of this fine tuning run and show you guys a job that I have already completed. And this is what a completed fine tuning job looks like. You can come in here and take a look at metrics and you know, scroll through the different metrics for, for the text generation job. Um, you can decide if this model was good enough. You know, if it looks like, hey, the fine tuned model works great on this data, you can come back here and register the model in your workspace, right? And if not, of course, fine tuning is an iterative process. You could go back, change any of those parameters we looked at and submit a new fine tuning run. So you can come in here, you can give your model names, you know, let's call it uh, PyTorch Conf Demo Model, and then go ahead and register it, right? And that takes a short moment to register, but I'll show you a previously registered model that I have in my workspace. And uh, let's go find that one. This was a previously registered model I had. Uh, if I want to go ahead and deploy this model, you know, deploy it to an endpoint that I can use, it's again as straightforward as coming in here, going and deploying it to a batch endpoint, giving it the compute I need. You know, if I wanted to test it out, I could run it on one instance. If I want redundancy, I might want to give it more instances of compute to run on. And um, go ahead and click on deploy here. Again, the deployment will take a few minutes to complete. So instead, what I would do, instead of like in the interest of time for this demo, I would switch over to a deployment that I already have of the fine-tuned model. It's, it's been fine-tuned on the same data set. So I can test it out. I can test out my deployed fine-tuned model here and give it a dialog that I want my fine-tuned model to summarize, right? You can see in here there's a dialogue between two people, and let's see how this fine-tuned model does. Right? So that was pretty nifty. It took in a relatively long dialogue between two people and gave me the summarized caption that I can use in my application. So it's, it's, really, it's really fairly straightforward to use any of the Llama 2 models in Azure be it deployment, be it evaluation, be it fine tuning of that model, it's, it's all, um, our, our goal has been to make it as simple and easy for our users to use, right? Uh, once you have this model endpoint deployed, 
regardless of whether it's your pre-trained model or whether it's your fine-tuned model deployment. You can point to that endpoint from your different applications or from within prompt flow, and so you can use the Llama model easily in prompt engineering as well. So it's, it's, it's really, again, you know, very, very straightforward and easy to use uh, Llama on Azure. You know, we are very excited to see what people can build with this because the goal has been to make it easy for all to use. And with that, we want to truly democratize AI, you know, and make, make these transformative technologies available to all Azure users. Uh, at the bottom here, I have a link to a blog which gives you more information about, you know, about this uh, offering where you can use Llama on Azure. But I also wanted to leave some time open for questions in case any of you have questions on this. But that's all I had in the demo. It is already public, yes, absolutely. And if you click, if you, I guess you all should have access to these slides. If you get to this blog, that will also have links to the Azure machine learning offering. If not, it's very simple, ml.azure.com. That's where you go in. That's, that's the URL for the Azure machine learning studio. And that's where you can access all of these capabilities in the, in the model catalog, like this thing here. All of this product that we saw in here is under ml.azure.com. So this is the part you need to go to. It's publicly available. You can go ahead and start trying it right now. Other questions? Sorry, say that again. Um, right now, we have support for LoRa. In the future, we might add more. Yeah, I don't know that we have um, published any recommendations around data size. Right now, it's a matter of, you know, most users come and try it out with their data set, and um, I, I can see I, I, if we can publish something around those recommendations. But most users come in with, like, whatever data set they have. Um, oftentimes, we hear in the real world that people don't have sufficient training data, right? So whatever they have, they start fine-tuning with. <laughs> 